self-regulatory models can work. Uh, I was asked to testify in front of the, uh, the President Obama's uh, Gulf Oil Spill Commission as to why self-regulation can work in the nuclear industry and would it be important to be a part of the natural gas and, uh, and other industry. Uh, I, I certainly agreed that it would be, uh, and indeed the conclusions in their report are the ones you see in the lower right. The oil and gas industry should establish a private organization to develop, adopt, and enforce standards of excellence. Regrettably, they have not done so. <coughs> Let's talk about Chernobyl. Uh, it's obviously a, uh, the most significant nuclear mishap uh, in, the, in the history of commercial nuclear power. April 26, 1986, it was a Russian RBMK-1000, no way similar to anything that we operate in the, uh, in the United States. It was a graphite-moderated reactor. It was uh, basically unstable, had a, uh, had a positive void coefficient for you nuclear engineers in here that, uh, that indicated that uh, if it started forming steam bubbles in the coolant that uh, it would actually create uh, more uh, of uh, energy generation and actually drive the thing unstable. It was not a nuclear explosion, as many of you may know. It was a steam explosion, actually, that, uh, that blew the reactor apart. And, uh, and tragically, uh, because it had no containment, uh, uh, the uh, uh, a number of people died in the initial explosion, and uh, certainly some courageous first responders died afterwards. How did it happen? Well, the answer is they had uh, they were doing an unauthorized test, having disabled all the safety systems to see if in the uh, in the minutes shot following an emergency shutdown, the uh, the residual steam pressure could generate enough electricity to run the safety systems for the plant. They had asked for permission from, uh, from higher authority to do the, the, the test. The te that permission was denied. They proceeded anyway. And so, and in order to make it all work, to keep the reactor from shutting itself down, they had to disable the safety system. So, you know, they kind of set themselves up for the, uh, uh, for the mishap. And, uh, and the results, as they say, are history. And there's still a 30 kilometer radius around, uh, around Chernobyl that uh, is uh, denied occupancy. <clears throat> Let's talk about Fukushima. Uh, six boiling water reactors, uh, almost uh, 5,000 megawatts of generating capacity. Uh, very successful plant, old design, 19, early 1970s designs. Uh, it's it experienced a magnitude 9.0 earthquake. Uh, it weathered the earthquake just fine. Uh, the Japanese had modified their reactors, and when they sensed an earthquake, they shut down immediately. Uh, what they did not account for was the 46-foot tsunami. They had a seawall that was only 15 feet high, and as a result, the tsunami swamped them, swept away the fuel supply for the emergency diesel generators, flooded the uh, power distribution uh, uh, switchgear rooms, which were below grade, so they became swimming pools, which is not a good thing for, uh, uh, for electricity generation. And as a result, they lost the ability to pump cooling water through, and as you're well aware, uh, three of the plants had a, uh, had a meltdown. Uh, there are no radiation fatalities as a result of this. Tragically, three died. Uh, one was a crane operator who was crushed uh, by, the, uh, by the tsunami, and two were people who went out before the, uh, after the earthquake to check out the plant and were drowned because they were below grade when the, uh, when the tsunami hit. Uh, the evacuation and, uh, and energy impact is huge on Japan. I visited Japan in my capacity as the uh, CEO of the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, and you know, it, it, was, it was really sobering. When I went to see the, uh, the head of uh, uh, Tokyo Electric Power uh, at his headquarters in Tokyo, uh, the building was dark. The, the Japanese had to uh, account for losing up to a third of their electricity generation, and uh, clearly a sobering and long-lasting experience for Japan as they still wrestle, as they begin to restart finally a number of these reactors going forward, it still is going to have significant impact with them uh, going forward. What, was wrong, what went wrong there? Well, the design criteria, uh, perhaps. Uh, if you go back far enough in the history, there have been instances of both earthquakes and tsunamis of that magnitude in Japan. They were not part of the database uh, and certainly not part of the planning uh, and, and site uh, construction uh, at, uh, at Fukushima. <clears throat> Despite all that, the global industry is booming, uh, no pun intended. Uh, there are 435 uh, nuclear power plants in 30 countries, as I mentioned. There are 56, I updated that this morning, uh, plants under construction in 13 countries, uh, four in the United Arab Emirates, uh, 
uh, 20 in, over 20 in, uh, in China, and there are 30 countries continuing to express interest because of the advantages for nuclear that I talked about earlier. This is going to have challenges, though. Uh, how do you oversee the quality of construction, the, the operator skills? How do you ensure that? I mean, even if you're not building nuclear, uh, and, but how about if you're downwind of someone that is? And how do you think about that from a national perspective is, uh, is extremely important. And, uh, and that, too, needs to be cranked into our consideration of energy policy. Let's talk a little bit about risk. Uh, most of you may know Steve Chu, former Secretary of Energy, Nobel Laureate. He's back on campus here at Stanford, and uh, you can see his quote uh, from a couple of years ago. Again, back to the issues with carbon dioxide emissions and, and do the, the, does the climate math work without, uh, without nuclear? <coughs> he believes it does not. Ernie Moniz, who followed him as Secretary of the Energy under, uh, under President Obama, uh, more productive approach to developing nuclear power is long overdue. NASA study on climate change shows that coal and gas are far more harmful than nuclear power. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> Richard Lester, who is chair of the nuclear engineering department at MIT, uh, expresses his views. Uh, Bert Richter, who, who regrettably passed away uh, uh, two weeks ago on the 18th of July, also a Nobel laureate here on the, uh, on the Stanford campus. Uh, says, nuclear power provides us with one of the safest, most cost-effective alternatives to continuing on our present course. We should be moving vigorously to increase the nuclear energy supply. And then James Hansen, a noted environmental uh, uh, analyst, uh, expresses his view. So there are people out there, considered folks, not extremists or the like, who believe that nuclear needs to be part of the consideration of, uh, of how we address the climate issues going forward. Let's be a bit more direct. Uh, when Steve Chu talks, he uses a metric called uh, deaths per uh, kilowatt hour. It's a bit macabre uh, and a bit negative, but it, what it does is take the fatalities associated with an industry uh, and divide it by the, the amount of electricity that that, that uh, uh, fuel generate or electricity generation source indicates. Obviously, coal, gas, oil, and biomass are the, are the largest. They put particulate matter, CO2, into the air. Hydropower, interestingly enough, is is, uh, is much uh, worse than uh, in this, by this metric than wind and nuclear, largely because hydro, you have to account not just for construction issues and the like, but dam failures and what happens downstream uh, when thousands of people are, uh, are, uh, are inundated by, uh, by a failed dam. Wind power, you think, well, where does that come from? What's hazardous about that? Well, believe it or not, people fall off wind turbines. And because you have such a small number of uh, a low level of generation, wind power uh, contributes 1.3% of the United States electricity today. Because you divide the number of fatalities by a relatively low generation rate, you get a much higher number. Nuclear power, uh, the, the lowest of them all, uh, includes all of the mining accidents, includes all of the deaths that we've talked about at, uh, at uh, Chernobyl, and even some uncertain, from a medical standpoint and dose standpoint, uh, predictions of what people who might uh, die in the future as a result of, of those mishaps, and it's still the lowest um, amongst uh, all of the, uh, uh, the major generation sources. Again, that's not the only metric, but it's something to do, deal with when we think about risk and, uh, and our risk acceptance and the like, because that too is part of the human dimension and part of the policy issues that need to be considered. Uh, 2016 uh, was the safest year in U.S. coal mining history. Only six people died. That was a record. 2017, it was 16 again. So, I mean, in terms of, you know, if that's not the only metric, and that's and, and any loss of any life is is a tragedy beyond all telling. But the reality is, if you look at statistically, which is one way of looking at it, it's uh, uh, nuclear power is the safest of them all. These are more specific energy source mortality rates. Uh, no surprises there with coal and, uh, uh, and oil and uh, natural gas. You can see it varies widely by country. Uh, coal creates far more deaths in China where scrubbers and, uh, and filters are, are less utilized. Uh, China, in, uh, in response to its energy demands, is starting up uh, two 600 megawatt coal plants every w two weeks uh, now to, uh, to meet their energy demands, in addition to the 20 nuclear power plants that are under construction. So. Uh, things are uh, growing. So rooftop solar has an amazing, uh, amazingly high level, again, because of accidents. Uh, 
people fall off rooftops installing, installing solar. And once again, as you can see, by any measure, uh, nuclear in the U.S. is, uh, is incredibly low. <clears throat> What about new nuclear technology? Well, in reality, as I mentioned the startups earlier, um, few of these technologies are new. Most of these have been tried before and are not ineffective. Uh, I talked about the Navy nuclear program, and, and I have great regard for, uh, for Admiral Rickover. But if he did one thing that uh, adversely affected uh, the nuclear industry, it's that he picked a winner. Uh, he picked uh, pressurized water reactors for the propulsion of Navy nuclear ships, which then were translated into uh, either PWRs or boiling water reactors for, uh, for, commercial, uh, for commercial nuclear power generation. And as a result, research and development on virtually every other nuclear opportunity stopped. Okay? Uh, and all of these have been successfully tried before, if not in the US, by, uh, by other nations, with the exception of the last one. Uh, the, uh, the one above that, micro reactor, small modular reactors are something that are being considered now. I've done some work with George Schultz on, on this just because of the, uh, uh, the fact that they can be built in this country, uh, whereas the larger reactors, we don't have the steel uh, fabrication facility in this country to build them anymore. You have to go to France or to, uh, uh, or to Japan for that. Uh, micro reactors are very small reactors. We actually once had uh, uh, nuclear reactors operating at the South Pole. We had nuclear reactors in the uh, in the Panama. We had nuclear reactors powering the uh, the early warning radars in uh, in Greenland. Uh, those kinds of things. So we know how to how to do those. The only piece that has not been demonstrated successfully is fusion, uh, which is the opposite of fission, where you bring the uh, uh, the atoms together and uh, and dr generate uh, uh, tremendous amounts of energy with no uh, uh, adverse byproducts. There are those that tout uh, advantages for potential new uh, reactors. You see a number of them here. I'm not going to go through each of those. Uh, uh, but again, uh, there's enough thought process going on that uh, uh, a couple of dozen startups are considering it. And uh, we'll see where it goes. The problem, of course, is uh, the cost for first-of-a-kind adopters. And uh, how do you get funding for this in a world where gas is still $2 a therm, why do I need to pay so much money for research and development to advance nuclear? It's a fair question, but again, it comes back to what are the broader policy issues and how do we need to address those going forward? So how do we think about nuclear energy policy? Wrapping up here, uh, do we think large or small? Do we think system tweaks or do we think large sweeping policy changes? How are we going to approach this? Given where we are and the relative breathing room that we now have to craft a broader energy policy, you could look at a, at a national energy policy. In 2005, uh, the Congress passed what was called the, uh, the Energy Policy Act, okay? And it was a uh, kind of a kludge of subsidies here and subsidies there. The, the problem was we have an Energy Policy Act. In reality, we still don't have a national energy policy. Is it time to think about that and create it? Nations can do that. Uh, France did, for example, in the 60s. Uh, Charles de Gaulle decided that for the honor of France, uh, uh, they were going to be energy independent, and they decided they were going to go nuclear, and 80% of their electricity is generated by nuclear. A significant share beyond that is uh, generated by hydro, and as a result, they, uh, they are much better positioned in this uh, now environmentally concerned world than, uh, than our other nations. So it is possible. But it's a different departure. It's, it's something we have not done before, but something we might want to talk about. George Schultz talks often about a revenue neutral carbon tax. I mentioned the value of leveling the playing field rather than picking and choosing subsidies and winners and losers. If you tax everybody based on how much carbon they generate, then the, renew then the, then the market can fairly and appropriately address who the winners and the losers are. So that might be a way to do this. Take the subsidies away from everybody, except for the fact that if you don't generate carbon, uh, you, uh, you don't pay a, a penalty for that. If you do generate carbon, you have a quantified cost on carbon that's been tried uh, in California, uh, not very successfully, been tried in Canada and other places a bit more successfully, but something that could be done to, uh, uh, to balance the, pl the playing field. What about spent fuel storage and reprocessing? Uh, we talked about storage earlier, that it's a political issue, not a, uh, uh, not a technical one. Reprocessing uh, is an interesting thing. Uh, uh, we don't reprocess the fuel. Uh, you may be aware that uh, when spent fuel comes out of a U.S. commercial nuclear reactor after three burns, three cycles, they move it around uh, every two years, and after six years it comes out, uh, 
95% of the energy is still in it. In other words, it, the, uh, the fuel has been poisoned by actinides that prevent the, uh, the fission. Uh, and, but you know, from an energy standpoint, if you reprocess it and take the actinides out, which the French do, the Russians do, the British do, the Japanese do, the Chinese do, then you get 95 to 97% of the energy back. And so, in other words, it's not quite a perpetual motion machine, but it's, uh, it's pretty close when you think about that. Yet we, as a, as a nation, don't pursue reprocessing. That's an option, should we choose to do so. Uh, fuel diversity, there's value in having various sources of, uh, of fuel, as we saw in uh, the polar vortex when uh, natural gas uh, got into short supply because of failures in national ga natural gas pipelines a couple of years ago. Uh, Air pollution, we've talked about. Carbon emissions, certainly. Grid stability, I've explained. Uh, cost volatility, uh, natural gas is low now, but it's been higher. Oil prices vary dramatically. Uh, all sorts of energy uh, volatility issues confront us, but that's not so in the nuclear industry. You can predict with almost certainty what those nuclear prices are going to be for the long term, and you can buy and procure and store it very, very comfortably. Fuel security, we get uranium from Canada. Uh, and, and reliable partners. It doesn't come from the Middle East. There's the, uh, the old uh, discussions about workforce and, uh, and community support for nuclear and the jobs that it brings, supply chains. One piece that uh, I addressed earlier is there's a national security and nuclear ecosystem we need to be aware of as well. There's a symbiotic relationship between uh, uh, the Navy and the, uh, and the Defe Department of Defense nuclear industry and the, uh, the commercial enterprise in terms of education, in terms of parts, in terms of suppliers and the like that, uh, that is an important consideration. Our ability to influence geopolitical and safety standards and norms and, and, the, uh, and the option of uh, improving or enhancing nuclear technology going forward. So how do we think about a, a national energy policy, though? First off, it has to be fair and reasonable, and it's got to be seen as such. We have a very difficult time sometimes in this country having those kinds of policy debates, whether it's in Scott's area about health care or, or very many other uh, uh, policy issues. But in this case, it absolutely has to be done. Long-term decisions and investment have to transcend politics and cross administrations. I talked the timeline for a, a commercial nuclear power plant being a decade or more. That transcends uh, uh, at least two and potentially three administrations. So we can't be whipsawing ourselves back and forth on a policy. We need to find a way to bring a national consensus to that. And effective leadership is going to require that integrity has to be a hallmark of all of this. It's not always the case. We've got to be open and honest and have crucial conversations and, if necessary, confrontations so that we can hammer out something that best serves the interests of the nation and, uh, and the world. And consistent science and modeling is essential. Uh, when you talk to people on both sides of the, the nuclear discussion or the uh, renewables discussion, whatever, everybody has their own model. You know, you have to ask yourself, well, where's truth in all of that? Because inevitably, the model that you have, the model that you build, tends to give you the answer that you want. Is it possible to create a model that, uh, for example, allows you to investigate what happens if I do more renewables and less nuclear? What happens if I add more natural gas? Where is the analytical rigor and agreed to before, in advance, before the analytical process that allows you to better inform the conversation and the debate? It's very, very difficult to do. Years ago when I was a, a, a fighter pilot, we used to have models that allowed us to decide if you were planning a long-range strike into a, an enemy's uh, uh, target set, you could decide if you had one more dollar to spend, would you buy standoff jamming? Would you buy stealth technology? Would you buy precision guided weapons? And you could adjust the rheostats to figure out where you could, how, what you needed to do to optimize your probabilities of success. We don't have that in the, uh, in the energy world and, uh, and we need it badly. <clears throat> so in conclusion, we find ourselves in a place we've never been where we're not stressed by energy issues, by shortages, by gas lines, by exorbitant prices and the like. With, and we also have opportunities we've never had to begin to think about what a national energy strategy might look like. It's a fleeting window, as you've seen the decline in nuclear going forward, uh, to redefine our energy security in, times, in terms beyond our domestic needs. And we can embrace leadership opportunities and create a framework where we can all prosper economically, progress societally, and participate in shared energy security. But it's a huge challenge. What does the future look like?
What is it going to look like? That's what you're going to define here as you move into this space, should you choose to do so. Patrick Moore is a co-founder of Greenpeace. You see what he thinks about nuclear power. <clears throat> but you can only go to that future if you address the issues on the lower left. The safety of, uh, of nuclear, the environmental reality of it, spent fuel and the like, the economics, the real issue of public acceptance. You know, are they ever going to be willing to accept anything that has the N-word in it, nuclear? Uh, national policy, the lack thereof, and then spent fuel storage has to be a consideration as you look in the upper left at the entrance to the Yucca storage facility. James Lovelock believes that only nuclear power can halt global warming. But the nuclear industry has to address that it's no longer enough to try and prevent accidents. You also have to have an effective way to respond to them. When I talk about risk, I talk about uh, measuring the risk in any enterprise, about minimizing the risk, about managing the risk that remains, and then finally a mitigation strategy if despite your best efforts, something happens. Uh, we've seen that despite all of that, with the exception of the egregious acts at uh, Chernobyl, the actual impact from a, from a radiation standpoint of nuclear accidents has been relatively small. And you saw that respect in the, reflected in the uh, in the statistical analysis, but that's, more, that's not enough. There's more than that uh, from a societal standpoint. It's going to require new relationships. It's got international dimensions, and there's, uh, it's time for a real challenge and, uh, and real change. There are opportunities there, and there are risks, but there's also a promise there that I think it may just be too early to, uh, uh, to ignore. Years ago, when I was uh, at INPO, I went to a meeting of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Budapest, and Mohamed El Baradai gave a talk. Uh, he was then the director general of the IAEA. He later went on to uh, back to Egypt and was part of the, the revolutionary effort in Tahrir Square, if you remember that. Uh, but in those days, he talked about the promise of nuclear energy. Now, he talked about it in two contexts, though. Obviously, the promise, the emissions-free, low-cost electricity generation for the betterment of all mankind. But there was a second promise he talked about. And that was the promise that those engaged in the nuclear enterprise had to make to the world, to their nation, uh, to their industry, and to themselves, that they would do everything in their power to ensure that everything they contributed to, uh, to nuclear energy was done as well as it could possibly be done. That's the real promise of, uh, of nuclear energy, and it takes, it takes leadership. As Stuart Brand says, uh, uh, you've got to have a substantial role for advanced nuclear power, but only if the long-term issues are addressed, and there's leadership in all of this. And that's the, uh, the issue that we, we're wrestling with today, almost the rhetorical question. What's the role of leadership? How much are we going to be passive, let this play out in the marketplace as it will, and then perhaps look back with regret on a missed opportunity to shape an energy policy that, uh, that better served our needs for the future? <clears throat> Richard Lester, again, the chairman of the uh, Nuclear Engineering Department at MIT, uh, talks about uh, how we've lost ground to our international competitors, our influence of the over the nuclear security regime has waned, and it's one of the unfortunate legacies of the years of policy drift that now, at the very moment that climate concerns are building and the need for new sources of low-carbon energy is growing more urgent, the ability of nuclear energy to respond to this need is in doubt. To take it closer to home, and in the interest of full disclosure, uh, when I talked about some of the things, and I, and I took the title of this from, uh, from a book that uh, was written by two of my, uh, my Hoover colleagues, uh, <clears throat> uh, Jeremy Carl and David Fedor, uh, this is part of the introduction that George Schultz and I wrote to that. And uh, <clears throat> if one was to describe a new power generating technology with almost no pollution, practically limitless fuel supplies, reliable operations, scalable and statistically far safer than existing alternatives, it would understandably sound like a miracle. Our energy needs would be solved, and no wonder the early American advocates of nuclear fission were so excited. Experienced reality is always more complicated, of course, and we should bring to bear the country's best minds and science and technologies to navigate that process responsibly. New challenges will emerge, as will new opportunities, and in our view, it's far too early to take nuclear off the table. With that, I thank you for your consideration and I welcome any uh, questions.